There we go. Um, I also posted the slides already, so they're on my Fast Wonder blog speaking page. I also tweeted about them and posted them on Mastodon. So you can get the slides if you'd like them. I have been in the technology industry for well over 20 years and working mostly on open source projects with a focus on community strategy, metrics, and growing your contributor base. And I can tell you that it is really hard to build a strong open source community for a project. Most of us struggle with finding enough humans to sustain our projects. So let's start by talking more about the problem and why it can be so hard to achieve sustainable contributor growth for open source projects. Now, an alien life form on Star Trek The Next Generation once described humans as ugly bags of mostly water. Now, I think they got the ugly part wrong, but we were kind of squishy, right? And not just in the physical sense. We can be unpredictable and irrational. And especially when we're stressed out, overworked, or burnt out. And the reality is that we are not robots. We're not mindless automatons. Hel humans have feelings. We have bad days. We have other commitments and personal challenges in our lives that are often invisible to other contributors and can really get in the way of our contributions to open source projects. But you can't have an open source project without having human beings to maintain it. So you need to be able to encourage people to participate in ways that are sustainable over the long term for the project and also for those people. Now, many projects struggle to find people who will actively participate in their projects and continue to participate over the long term. If it was easy, you would already have all of the people you needed to maintain your project and none of you would actually be here watching this talk. We're in a situation now where there are loads and loads of open source projects and not enough contributors. So maintainers are burning out and are in desperate need for help. Sometimes it can be really difficult to get people to contribute to your project. And unfortunately, there's, there's no magic. There's no one size fits all solution. So throughout this talk, I'll focus on some things you can do to increase the chances of successfully building a community and growing contributors for your project. Open source project maintainers are also squishy human beings with feelings and bad days. Maintaining an open source project is hard work. And it's work that often extends out over many, many years. And maintainer burnout's common within open source projects. Even the really big successful open source projects like Kubernetes struggle with maintainer burnout and growing the contributor community. It can be hard for already overworked maintainers to balance the day-to-day -day work required to actually keep the project running while also investing in additional activity to increase future community sustainability. Now, this creates a vicious cycle where maintainers don't have enough time to onboard new contributors, leading to fewer contributors, which leads back to no time to onboard new contributors. So while it takes a bit more time up front, if you can invest at least some time in activities that will help you onboard a few new humans, like onboarding documentation, for example, you can increase the chances that you'll break out of this vicious cycle. Another way to free up some time for maintainers to break out of this cycle is by getting help with different types of contributions that take up valuable time and are required to make an open source project successful. Things like documentation, marketing, community management, and so many other things. For projects with complex code bases, it can sometimes be easier to onboard people into some of these roles to free up, free up some time to onboard other contributors later. Okay, now that we've talked about the factors that can impact contributor growth and why it can be so challenging, I'll shift into talking about some strategies for growing your contributor base and using contributor ladders to help find more humans who can grow into leadership positions. And finally, I'll talk about some metrics that you can use to measure project sustainability, along with some resources and final thoughts. 
As promised, let's start by talking about developing and executing on a long-term contributor growth strategy, including motivation, governance, new contributor onboarding, mentoring, and leadership. People's motivations for contributing to your project vary widely. Some people are contributing as a part of their job, while others might contribute to gain experience about a particular language or technology. You don't really have any control whatsoever about what originally motivated these humans to show up in your project. <clears throat> but there are things you can do to motivate them to stick around, regardless of why they showed up in the first place. Clear communication and reducing friction are key to helping people stick around. I'll talk more in upcoming slides about the importance of explicit and clearly documented governance, along with solid onboarding docs and fostering a welcoming and inclusive community. There are also other things you can do to motivate people to contribute. Having good first issues or help wanted labels are excellent places to start because these help the humans find something that they can work on while they learn more about the project. Good first issues should be targeted at something simple that a brand new contributor could pick up and complete in a short amount of time to help them learn more about your contribution process. Help wanted labels can be for issues that are a little more involved so that people who have already started to contribute can find something else to work on. Now, good first issues and help wanted labels are great, but they're passive requests for help. So I also encourage maintainers to be proactive and specific about the ways that people can help. Asking someone specific to review a PR or answer a question from a user demonstrates that you recognize their unique expertise and that you want their help. This is what motivated me to start contributing to the CNCF tag contributor strategy. Uh, Paris Pittman asked me to write a guide for the tag about measuring project health, a topic that admittedly I am pretty passionate about. And it made me feel good that she recognized my expertise and wanted my help. Knowing that we're wanted and appreciated makes us squishy human beings feel good, which can be a strong motivator to contribute to an open source project or to continue contributing over a period of time. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people like to hate on governance. It's just paperwork and busy work and politicking that gets in the way of doing the real work on the project. Um, but this is not true of good governance, which is really about setting expectations and getting all of the various humans within your community collaborating together. Ultimately, the focus of open source project governance is on people, the roles we play, our responsibilities, how we make decisions, and what we should expect from each other as a part of participating in the community. The goal should be to make the processes for participation as obvious as possible, even for people who are brand new to the community. Having clear rules about how collaboration occurs, how decisions are made, what types of contributions are in or out of scope, helps community members make contributions that are likely to be accepted and embraced by the project. This helps avoid wasting maintainers' time with contributions that are not aligned with the project a healthy project with clear governance makes the humans happy and helps set your project up for future growth and long-term success. Another aspect of governance is about making it easier to move people into areas of increasing responsibility, which helps reduce the load on existing maintainers. And we'll talk about this more later in the section on contributor ladders and leadership. And the good news is you don't have to start from scratch. We have some good templates that we've developed for the CNCF but they apply to most projects to help you quickly and easily build out some, at least some basic governance for your project. I suspect some of you are still thinking that you don't need to spend any time documenting governance, but think about this from the perspective of the new contributor. It is much more difficult to participate in a community if you don't know anything about the role you might play, the expectations, the key players, or the rules for participating. Explicit Documented governance gives new and existing contributors a clear path into leadership and help guide them through the project. Spending a bit of time documenting governance up front can save you some time later with fewer questions about how things work, and it gives you a document that you can point the other humans to if they have questions. 
When I start contributing to a new open source project, I want to know how decisions are made and who makes those decisions, which helps me understand whether decisions are likely to be made fairly based on solid information um, from people who have the right expertise to make those decisions. And I also want to be able to see a clear path into leadership for, for me or my colleagues if we decide to embrace the project over the long term. The bottom line is that if the processes for collaboration and decision making are not clearly documented as part of your project governance, this introduces a lot of uncertainty into the mix. And uncertainty makes the humans nervous. So Claire talked about this in the context of InnerSource. It increases the barrier to contribution and it jeopardizes the health and viability of your project. Good documentation is how we scale the things that take up precious time for those already overworked human beings, like answering the same onboarding questions over and over and over. Now, I see so many open source projects with contributing guides that frankly just don't provide any useful information whatsoever. At a minimum, a new contributor needs to understand how to spin up a development environment so they can do their development on the project, the expectations for testing and how to run tests, and any processes or expectations you have for pull requests, and then instructions for any other requirements, like maybe they need to sign a contributor license agreement before they start. If this is all well documented, new contributors can get started with a minimal amount of help from existing maintainers which can save you a lot of time in the long run. When a project doesn't have good onboarding docs, those squishy, burnt out maintainers can get frustrated by the amount of time they spend on new contributor questions, which can make it hard for new contributors to feel welcome. And it can take them a long time to become productive. And this is how the humans get discouraged and drift away from your project. Now, this does not mean that you need to spend days and weeks and months writing the perfect onboarding documentation. Anything is better than having nothing. And if you start with a few things that can help people get started more quickly, new contributors can actually help make the onboarding documentation better by adding more details and additional instructions for things that they found confusing or maybe something that they struggled with. Your project should also be designed to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion top of mind. Building a diverse community where all of the humans feel welcome and included does not just happen. It requires putting work and thought into it. But this is time well spent, providing an environment where everyone, including people from marginalized populations, feel safe, is the first step toward building a diverse community around your project. Ideally, having programs that give people opportunities for shadowing, mentoring, and sponsoring new potential leaders can help you grow a diverse set of people into new leaders for your project. The Kubernetes Contributor Experience SIG is a great place to see some examples of how to implement programs for things like shadowing and mentoring. Projects that make a concerted effort to bring in new people from a variety of backgrounds and have programs in place to help them then grow into leadership positions are more likely to benefit from increased innovation and just have a healthier overall community. And by having a diverse and welcoming community, you have the advantage of getting the humans who might not feel welcome in other projects. Now this is still kind of part of the strategies section, but it's important enough that I wanted to call it out separately in its own section because moving new humans into leadership positions is a key part of growing your contributor base and scaling your project. And I'll talk more about this in the context of contributor ladders, which is a good way to do this. Defining the roles and responsibilities for contributors, reviewers, and maintainers can help with recruiting new humans into these roles. It can help to think of this as a ladder where contributors can climb up to become reviewers and those reviewers can become maintainers. And what's important is to document and make sure that people understand how they can climb this ladder and gain more responsibilities within the project. A contributor ladder usually outlines the different contributor roles within the project along with the responsibilities and privileges that come along with them. Community members generally start at the first levels of the ladder and advance up it as their involvement in the project grows. And for each rung of the ladder, you can define responsibilities, 
which are the things that the contributor is expected to do. Requirements, which are the qualifications that a person needs to meet to become, um, to move into that role. And privileges are things that contributors on that level are entitled to, like maybe they get special access to events or something like that. And all of this helps set expectations for the roles and encourages people to think about how they might take on areas of increasing responsibility within the project. As you get more of the humans moving into maintainer roles, you can reduce the load for the existing maintainers. And the good news is that there's also a template that you can use to avoid building this from scratch. It definitely has more roles than most projects need, so it's designed to be simplified and customized for your project's needs. Project leadership is one of the key elements of good governance, and this is how you scale your project. So you should have some kind of documentation about your leadership. For small projects, maybe you have, you have a list of maintainers that includes which of the humans are responsible for various areas within your project. And there are quite a few different options for selecting leaders as part of defining your governance. And the ideal is to have a process that provides a fair and level playing field that defines how contributors can become leaders. And this should be documented so that all of the participants can clearly understand the criteria and the process for moving into leadership positions. Some of the bigger projects, like Kubernetes, have an election process, at least for the very top levels of leadership, like a steering committee. But only the biggest projects really need something that complicated. Most projects have a relatively simple process where the existing leaders or maintainers select the new ones. And um, it's often, for example, new maintainers are nominated by existing maintainers. And maybe they become a maintainer after a certain number agree, or maybe there's a vote of some kind. Um, and there are a bunch of different options for selecting leaders. So I'm not going to cover them all, but there is a, a doc that has some ideas for how you might want to select leaders. But the key is to spend some time thinking about this as you document your governance and contributor ladder so that you can bring these new humans into leadership positions and reduce the load of the existing maintainers to help scale your project by growing your contributor base. Now, granted, mentoring takes a bit more time, maybe over the long run, but it's a good way to help existing contributors become even better with an eye toward moving them into leadership positions. So for busy maintainers, one good approach is to focus on mentoring the humans who have already been around for a while and are unlikely to disappear to help them learn to do some more complex, time-consuming tasks. Like with many things, mentoring is not something that has to be all or nothing. Nothing, You can time box it to whatever amount of time you can fit into your schedule. Even spending an hour a month or an hour a week to help someone quickly become more productive in your project can be time well spent if that person can take on a few tasks to reduce your load as a maintainer. You can even structure this as shadowing to allow them to watch and learn while you do some maintainer tasks that needed to be done anyway. And if you focus this on helping another human learn something that can free up your time later, this will be time well spent. Now, humans like to think of ourselves as irreplaceable, uh, but we are not. We move on to other jobs. We burn out. We retire. And let's face it, humans are mortal and we don't live forever. You should think about what you want to do next and how you can prepare someone else to take over after you move on. I encourage projects to have an option for people to move into emeritus roles, which recognizes the hard work that you've put into the project and gives others a point of contact if they have questions about what came before, while also allowing you to step away from the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the project and so I encourage you to think of stepping into an emeritus role as a successful way of handing off your duties to the next generation of maintainers for the project. Now, the strategic part of all of this comes in thinking about where your time would be best spent. I've given a lot of suggestions so far in the presentation, and you should not try to do everything at once. So I recommend you think strategically about where you should start. If you know you've had people interested in contributing, but they've given up when they couldn't get started, maybe you should start with onboarding docs. If you have a lot of casual contributors, maybe you should focus on the contributor ladder and governance to help move some of the other humans 
up to take on more responsibility and eventually move into leadership positions. One way to figure out the best place to start is by using metrics to help find problem areas and figure out where you should be spending your time. Time is precious, right? So it's important to identify problem areas where you can focus on the right things while avoiding wasting time on areas that are already working well. However, metrics do need to be interpreted in light of how you operate as a project and as a community and around all of the other things that are happening in your project. There's no one-size-fits-all interpretation of metrics, but I will talk in this section about what some trends might indicate and how you can think about addressing potential issues. One key area to look at for your project is responsiveness. So in this project, you can see that there are times when they have a lot of PRs in the backlog that need to be merged or closed. And if, this, if these PRs are coming from several regular contributors who aren't maintainers, it might be a good idea to look at how you can promote some of these humans to become reviewers, approvers, or maybe maintainers to help out with the workload. But as with any metrics, you need to interpret them in light of your project. There are other reasons that can cause an increase in the backlog, like everyone preparing for a great big release, or maybe a big conference, or just the vacation season. Um, so that might not be resolved by moving more people into leadership roles. So think about why you might have the backlog. It can also help to look at the types of contributors that you have. In this case, casual contributors are those drive-through contributors who make a small handful of contributions and then they sort of disappear forever. Regular contributors are the ones that stick around and make some contributions and then stick around and continue to make those contributions over a period of time. Core contributors are usually maintainers who make up most of the contributions and then stick around over the long term for your project. You can really learn a lot from this graph. If you have a very small number of casual and regular contributors, that can mean that people don't have the information to become productive and contribute. And in some cases, onboarding documents can help solve that issue. Another thing this graph can indicate is whether maybe you have some fundamental issues within the project that are driving the humans away. If you see the total number of contributors declining or the number of regular contributors declining, this can indicate some deeper issues, maybe with toxic community members or an unwelcoming environment that probably needs to be resolved first before any other actions that you would take to grow your community. Or it could mean that people are leaving your community for some other reasons, like maybe lack of responsiveness from the previous graph. Now, this metric um, was talked about yesterday. It's often called the bus factor or the lottery factor based on the idea that if one person disappeared after winning the lottery and that person was making most or all of the contributions, then that project would probably be screwed if they left. I recommend measuring this because there are a couple of things it can tell you. First of all, how big of an issue is your current contributor situation? If it's like this one, you really, really should focus on getting a few more humans that can eventually be moved into leadership roles. You might also find that there are people who are contributing more than you realized, which is the other reason this is a really good metric to look at. This can help you think about who you can encourage to contribute more or maybe find someone who could move up the ladder into a leadership role. And reaching out to someone and acknowledging their work and encouraging them to do more can help quite a bit with contributor growth. Sometimes people just need a bit of encouragement. And you can ask them for specific things that you know that they're good at. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there are communities I've gotten more involved in just because someone asked for my help. Now, before I wrap up this talk, let me leave you with a few resources that you might find useful. The CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group has a governance working group and a contributor growth working group. And we provide templates and guidance about contributor experience, sustainability, governance, and openness to help people develop strategies for maintaining healthy projects. We also have a contributor growth framework document that you might find useful. Uh, the Open Source Way Guidebook has just loads of details of metrics, definitions, and software that you can use to measure the, uh, that you can use when building and maintaining open source projects. Uh, the Chaos Project has loads of metrics, definitions, and software that you can use to measure the health of your existing community. And these are all great starting places for understanding how to grow your contributor community. 
I've mentioned the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group and linked to our resources on various slides, but I wanted to put in just a quick recruiting plug. So like with most open source projects, we are also looking for help. The resources and templates that I've linked to were all created by the humans behind the advisory group. And we can use your help to improve them and create new resources to help, in this case, CNCF projects. So if you're passionate about contributor growth, governance, or building community, and want to help CNCF projects improve in these areas, we'd love to have you join us and develop more resources and provide advice to projects. So let's wrap this up and provide just a few final thoughts. Maintaining an open source project is so much work. And there are so many maintainers who are overworked, exhausted, and burning out. The best way to address this challenge is by finding more humans and growing your contributor base. But it's, it's hard work. And it takes time away from the day-to-day -day activities now, which can be really hard to justify when you feel like you're barely keeping up as it is. In the long term, spending at least a little time on the things that can help you recruit and keep new contributors will be worth it. And as I mentioned before, you don't need to do everything at once. Spending just a little time on something to grow your contributor base is a great place to start. With that, thank you for coming to my talk and we can open it up for questions. Thanks, Dawn, for this really clear story on the growth strategies. So, uh, any questions from the audience? We don't have any questions online. Yes. Hey, so thank you for the really lots of uh, great um, content that it's, they are really useful, directly useful. Um, one thing that I always keep in mind, and I don't know how much, if you could shine some light on that, it's. Um, balancing the amount of work to have those contributions to the amount of work to do the work itself. How do you balance that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really hard question. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, it, it, is, it is really hard, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, especially if you're, if you're overworked and burnt out, the last thing you want to do is take time away from the day-to-day -day work to focus on something for, for the future. But I do think that it, it really is worth, worth the time spent. And I think, especially when you're already overworked and burnt out and exhausted, um, spending even just like a little time on something that's gonna help you in the future is, is worth it. And then maybe you can spend a little more time and free up a little more time and, and gradually increase it. So I think, I think my, my biggest advice on that really is, is starting small. So starting with something that you can that you can do in in maybe an hour, you know it's not it's not hard to carve out an hour or thirty minutes maybe between meetings or something to um, to work on something for for the future. But it's it's super hard uh, to create that balance. Absolutely right. Anybody else? Other questions? Hi, Don. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's, it's maybe really like on hands on, but uh, do you have any idea on how to do the career, la so the commuter ladder in that sense, you know, mm -hmm. practically, for example, in, in GitHub, if you would like to have some people, you can have the triaging ones, but how can we do the reviewer ones, for example, that they could review PRs, but without granting them write access and something like that. <laughs> so, because I, I love, what you mentioned there is like, and I yeah. believe it should be a more gradual uh, growth into commutership, for example, mm -hmm. but how, how do we do that? Yeah, GitHub permissions are a gigantic pain um, is, is kind of the summary of that, that question. And how do you actually implement some of this for your project? Um, you know, the, so the way some of the bigger projects do this, so, you know, Kubernetes has all done this with uh, this technology called Prowl which you know, you, nobody interacts directly with the permissions. You issue commands, and then this bot handles all of the, all of the things. But Prow is like, um, it's, it's a bear to run, um, unless you're the size of Kubernetes, it's not, not even worth it. But I have seen some people implementing some more granular permissions with GitHub Actions. So that's something we're actually looking at um, for CNCF projects. So we have a, people, a few people who are doing some kind of prototypes for how you could use GitHub Actions to better control the permissions. Um, but, you know, the other thing I would say is that, you know, 
sometimes it's, it's not a bad idea to give people a few more permissions than what, what you think they might actually need because you, you can always roll stuff back, right? I mean, it's not, it's not permanent. Like, you're not giving them admin access to be able to, like, you know, push releases or anything, but giving them access to, you know, to make commits when all you're asking them to do is, is review and triage. Maybe that's okay, depending on the, the type of project it is and how, you know, how badly someone could mess things up if they did more than what they were supposed to. But I think some of that um, can be addressed via, via education. Um, because it, like I said, it does have, you know, pretty good functionality for roll, rolling things back if somebody did something they shouldn't have. Other questions? Thanks very much, Don. Yeah, thank you.